Good morning. Welcome to Branson Christian Church. Do we have any visitors this morning? I see a, a hand, but it doesn't look like a visitor. Oh, that's <laughs> Ginger has something for you if you are a visitor. Hold them high. I like your helpers this morning, Ginger. <laughs> okay, if we if we have no official visitors, I don't need to go into a lot of detail about our situation, but I'll remind everyone that we're in the middle of a search for a new pastor, and we've been having pulpit supply, and this morning we're pleased to have Ross Stuckey with us this morning, and you can read more about him. I suppose you probably got something when you came in with your bulletin, so that should fill you in on a little bit of his background. Do we have some announcements? (laughs) Circle this date on the calendar. (laughs) Okay. Um, Larry? I I have a friend, a friend that I play tennis with, and he, um, his wife lost their mother just this morning, and they ask, we keep in his prayers. It's uh, Scott and Patty, can't remember the last name, Roberts. Anyway, okay. okay. Uh, remind you that you have a tear-off sheet in your bulletin. Um, if you, a visitor or a new member or anything to update us on, uh, please feel, fill that out and drop it in the offering plate. Our call to worship today is adapted from the 133rd Psalm, which you may or may not know is one of the shortest Psalms in the Bible, three verses long. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. For there the Lord has commanded his blessing. Let us worship the Lord in one body and one voice. You know, we, we know that we can worship God at any time, even, in fact, especially during our own times of silence, but we regularly come together from our individual worship into a fellowship of worship in Sundays, and that symbolizes our unity in spirit. So indeed, as the verse says, let us worship the Lord in one body and one voice. Our hymn... First hymn this morning is Crown Him with Many Crowns. If you're in the book, it's page 85. If not, you can read it on the screen. Let's stand.
Shall we pray? We gather, Lord, to celebrate your presence as a congregation. May this time of group worship translate into increased effectiveness in our own times of quiet worship and our interactions with others when we leave. In your name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing. When he rolls up his sleeves, just putting on the ritz. Our God is an awesome God. There is thunder in his footsteps and lightning in his feet. Our God is an awesome God. And the Lord wasn't joking when he kicked him out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very close, so you better be believed. seated.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus. In John chapter 14, we see the words of Jesus where he says, Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. What a comforting statement that is. You love all of us right where we are. And you love us for who we are. Our circumstances may vary as time passes. But because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever, we know that your love for us is constant. And we give you praise and thanks for that. May your love for us and our faith in you hold us steady and steadfast. And now, Lord, in the solitude of our own hearts and minds, we come to you in private prayer for the concerns of the ones on our prayer list of this congregation. Let us lift up others who are on our hearts this day. We pray for the men and women in the military, and especially those that we remember at this time. And Lord, we pray for those concerns that we have individually for ourselves, for healing, for encouragement, for comfort, for guidance. Lord, we are and should be always concerned for the poor in our midst. Help us in the faith community to know how to be a part of the solution. Help us to be change agents in the world. Give us courage to speak out about our faith, to teach those around us about your love for all people and bring justice and peace to those in need. We pray, Lord, for those who were killed and injured in the shootings in California and elsewhere this week, and for their families and friends who are grieving. And we pray that our leaders may find a way to put an end to these shootings. Oh God, we pray fervently that a way may be found to begin a pathway to peace in the war between Russia and Ukraine. And may the people who are suffering from the bombs falling on their cities find safety and comfort. We pray for our president and the men and women in his cabinet and the members of the Congress the governor of Missouri and the mayor of Branson, that they may be guided by the influence of the Holy Spirit. All these things we ask in the name of the Prince of Peace who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
I suspect most, if not all of us, have some kind of a favorite food from childhood or a special gathering, so much so that whenever we happen to run across it again, it can bring back memories of that childhood or that special gathering, and we can be right there. Imagine then what it was like for the disciples every time they would partake of unleavened bread or, or wine after the Last Supper and they were transported back to those memories of the night of the Last Supper. They must have relived it each time. That is, of course, symbolically then what each one of us does when we come to the Lord's table and celebrate communion. We remember and we celebrate his gift to us. As the scripture says, do this in remembrance of me. Our communion hymn is number 213, I think. Yes, I don't have it correct. in front of me. Yeah. he was handed over to suffering and death our Lord Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks to you he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said take eat this is my body which is given for you do this for the remembrance of me after supper he took the cup of wine and when he had given thanks he gave it to them and said drink this all of you this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. And now hear the prayers of the elders. Father, we gather at your table today to share in the love of all creation. Just as Jesus fed the multitudes with bread, we now come to you hungry, asking for the bread of inner peace, the bread of strength and courage, the bread of hope. We pray these things that you can only give so that we may live the kind of life that we have been called to do as followers of Christ, a life of gentleness, patience, love, and service. And now the prayer continues. God of mercy, we come to this table realizing that this is, cup is a strong symbol of your forgiveness and your will to restore us to relationship with you and with one another. As this cup is passed, let us realize your power of forgiveness working in us. Bless this cup, we pray in the name of the one who sealed with this cup your covenant of grace and mercy. Amen.
We're told in 1 Corinthians 12 that we all have different spiritual gifts and that one of them is cheerful giving. Not all of us are automatically blessed with that gift, so we have to remind ourselves of its importance to ourselves as well as the church. Each time we give our individual gifts, they automatically blend into one bigger gift from the body of believers that can help further God's work. The deacons will now come forward to collect the offering. We bring you our gifts, Lord. They represent not only our individual return of parts of your blessings, but also a combined gift from the body of the church. Use these gifts, indeed stretch them, to maximize their good, not only to our congregation, but to the larger body of the church. For we ask in thy name, amen. Reading this morning is from the 17th chapter of John, verses 20 through 23. It's from the New Revised Standard Version. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who believe in me and through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. This ends the scripture reading for today.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There is a saying that if two people agree about anything, one of them is unnecessary. <laughs> it's a way of saying that people differ in their opinions. There's absolutely no one who agrees with me about everything, nor is there any person who agrees with any of you about everything. It's a part of what enriches life. Agreement and uniformity is a good thing, so long as it does not stifle individual expression. People must be free to differ, to express their own thoughts unchallenged. Everyone must have the opportunity to have his say. It's one of the marks of the freedoms that we enjoy in this country. We're free to disagree with the president without being thought to be un-American. It's not that way in many places in the world. Likewise, in some churches, members are not free to disagree on certain subjects without being thought to be unchristian. Most of us prefer the freedom to read and interpret scripture for ourselves. We may not agree with some other people in the church, but we welcome their opinion, and we bristle with when some authority desires to impose on us something with which we disagree. Particularly as American Christians, we prefer a free expression of ideas. That is true in the Episcopal Church, which is my church, and it's true in the Disciples' Church as well. It's one of the reasons I attend this church, among others, among the other reasons. The Apostle Paul, in a letter to Corinth, one of the congregations he had established, tells them that he has heard that there had been quarreling amongst them. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 1. If you have your Bibles and if you want to look at the passage, chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, in Corinth there was dissension in the community, and there's no indication that this was caused by doctrinal differences, since Paul doesn't mention that at all. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 10, he writes, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. Paul doesn't say that division has already taken place, but he clearly indicates that personal opinion is about to create such a division. There's obviously quarreling. Arguments related to matters of personal preference have become contentious issues and threaten, threaten to tear apart the unity of God's people. And so Paul begins by addressing differences of opinion, which are matters of personal preference. And continuing at verse 12, Paul says, What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, Peter, some perhaps were especially attached to Paul as the founder of the church. Apollos, we know from the book of Acts, was a learned man, very persuasive, eloquent in preaching, and a man of wisdom. Some in the church at Corinth had their doubts about whether Paul was a legitimate apostle. Cephas, on the other hand, Peter, definitely was legitimate having been one of the original 12 disciples and who knew Jesus personally. There was another faction with people saying, I belong to Christ. We might think that this group had it right, unless it's an opportunity for a false and superior piety. In other words, all the rest of you belong to merely human leaders, but we belong to Christ. In other words, it's not simply a reminder to the other factions that Whatever your presence, we, whatever your preference, we all belong to Christ. But instead, it's an individualistic, selfish statement. Personal preference, matters of taste, the right to choose for oneself, these kinds of things can and sometimes do polarize the church into various factions. It's rare for someone simply to say without adding some adjectives or qualifications, I am a Christian, P. 
period. It's why I really like the attitude of the churches uniting in Christ, of which the Disciples Church and the Episcopal Church with nine other denominations are members. This organization was formerly Consultation on Church Union, C-O-C-U, COCU. Some of you may remember that name. Rather than trying to figure out through discussions and agreements how we can become united, which we did for 40 years, we agreed to a restart with a new name. And we began with the premise that we are already united in Christ through our baptisms. Disciples know that. That's your polar star. Now we can talk about our historical and theological differences. That should sound very familiar to you or members of the Disciples Church here. One of your founding members, Barton Stone in Lexington, Kentucky, in 1832 said, let the unity of Christians be our polar star. The Apostle Paul, writing to the people about divisions in the church, was referring to potential divisions in that local congregation. Of course, there were no denominations at that time. Now there are thousands of different denominations, all of which began with factions developing in congregations. That is not what Jesus prayed for. We heard that in the scripture reading. The church is uniting in Christ is concerned with denominations, not local churches. But divisions anywhere within the body of Christ is where it begins whether in a congregation or in a denomination. In my parish in Springfield, I experienced this firsthand. There were a group of people who wanted to leave our parish and establish another church, not in the Episcopal Church. And they wanted me to go with them and to be their leader. I said no, that God had called me to the Episcopal Church and to that congregation and God had not called me to go somewhere else. I said that schism within the church was a grave sin. And that if they did not want to stay in the Episcopal Church, there were many other churches in Springfield where they would be welcome. I managed to keep many of them who wanted to go, but most left. Most of the people in that faction left the church and started their own. It made me very sad. Paul reminds the Corinthians and us that Christ is not divided. And through a series of rhetorical questions, he reminds us that we have a common Lord and a common baptism. Before we ever begin to work out our own interpretations of scripture or express a preference, we were all given an identity in baptism, simply Christian. God includes us all in the body of Jesus Christ by our common baptism into his death and resurrection. Whatever our preferences and choices about other things, we belong to the one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church of Jesus Christ. We all belong to Christ. It's important that we be of one mind, of one purpose, of one belonging, simply in Christ. Because in such a place, meaningful discussions can take place without threat of division. And in such a place, personal preference is held in check by charity. That is, Agape love. To know that we are in such a community of brothers and sisters where members are united through a power greater than, the, than their own preference is a great blessing. In verse 25, Paul says, The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. In other words, the church is held together by the power of the gospel, which is the cross of Christ. 
In such a community, it would seem normal to sacrifice preferences for the good of the whole church. I have experienced such a community at Subiaco Roman Catholic Monastery in Arkansas, where along with some other non-Roman Catholics, I am an oblate. Oblates are men and women who have an official association with a Benedictine monastery, which I do have. I have experienced that community in many places, but I have not experienced it in every place. I've experienced that community of the love and acceptance of Jesus Christ in this congregation, in this church. That's one of the reasons I've been coming here for over a, a year now. You are disciples, and you have as your motto that unity is your polar star. But what is also important is that you are putting the lordship of Jesus Christ first in your lives, in your ministries, and in this congregation. I know that because I've experienced it here. I'm completely confident that in spite of whatever forces are working against the church today, in any place in the world, in any denomination, these forces will not defeat the work of Christ through his people. Do you believe that? Amen. Amen. There are times we must find other means besides those that are most familiar to accomplish the work that God has for us to do. We Christians have been called laity as well as clergy and have one mission, only one in that call. And that is to proclaim to all people that the good news of Christ's salvation, Christ crucified. When we are truly responsive to that mission, we avoid self-serving factions. Churches of whatever denomination that single-mindedly hold up Jesus as Lord and put aside self-serving, self-centered interests, these churches are strong and healthy regardless of their size. Churches that fail to do this and are more interested in themselves, their institution, their buildings and surroundings, these churches are weak regardless of their size. There are many branches of the church of Jesus Christ. There's only one mission that's given to us in the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Jesus is still the head of the church with all of its branches, all of them. We are one in Christ, but whether our unity is weakened or whether it's strengthened depends on how central the person of Jesus is individually and how central the person of Jesus is in your congregation. Just as surely as he called Peter and Andrew and James and John and the rest of the disciples, our Lord calls each of us. On the night before he was crucified and knowing that his time on earth was near the end, he prayed these words to his father concerning his followers. It's in John chapter 17, which was read just now. The glory that you have given me, I have given them so they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me, that they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Let us lift up Christ in everything we do and let us be a people who know that they are called by Christ for his work for his service, for his mission. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.